The Borden Killings Lizzie Borden took an axe and gave her mother forty wax. When she saw what she had done, she gave her father forty-one. The Borden Murders is a notorious crime that occurred in 1892 in Fall River, Massachusetts. Andrew Borden, a successful merchant, and Abby Borden, his second wife, were brutally murdered in their home with a hatchet. Lizzie Borden, Andrew's daughter, was arrested and placed on trial for the homicides as the main suspect. Lizzie Borden became a household name due to the case's national attention and intense media coverage. The trial was a spectacle with startling testimony and details which polarized public opinion on her guilt. While there is little doubt that Lizzie Borden committed the murders, the rhyme is not quite exact. Abby, Lizzie's stepmother, was 64 years old, and a hatchet, not an axe, was used as the murder weapon. And fewer than half of the rhyme strikes struck the victims, 19 of which struck Abby and 10 of which rendered the 69-year-old Andrew's face unrecognizable. Nonetheless, the rhyme accurately depicts the order of the homicides, which occurred approximately an hour and a half apart on August 4, 1892. Fall River, Massachusetts, a textile mill town 50 miles south of Boston, was a melting pot of new immigrants and wealth division between the different classes. Not only was Fall River shaken by the savagery of the crime, but also by the standing of the victims. Debates over Lizzie's culpability or innocence would be shaped by the town's cultural, religious, class, ethnic, and gender divisions and would draw an entire nation into its grisly specifics. In the early hours following the discovery of the bodies, the only known facts were that the killer murdered the victims in broad daylight on a bustling street, one block from the city's financial district. There was no clear motive, such as theft or sexual assault. Neighbors and bystanders did not hear anything, and no one saw a suspect entering or exiting the Borden property. Andrew Borden was not a typical citizen. Like other Bordens from Fall River, he was wealthy and influential. He had made investments in mills, banks, and property. However, Andrew had never flaunted his fortune. He lived in a modest home on an unfashionable street rather than on the hill, Fall River's affluent, trendy neighborhood. Lizzie, who was 32 years old and lived at home, wished to live on the hill. She was aware that her father could afford to leave a community dominated by Catholic immigrants, and as a staunch Protestant, she couldn't understand why he wouldn't. Lizzie and her older sister, Emma Lenora Borden, attended Central Congregational Church and had a relatively religious upbringing. Lizzie took part in many church activities as a young woman, including teaching Sunday school to the children of recent immigrants to the United States. She participated in religious organizations, including the Christian Endeavor Society, the Woman's Christian Temperance Union, and the Ladies' Fruit and Flower Mission. Andrew wed Abby de Fee Gray three years after Lizzie's mother, Sarah, passed away. Lizzie stated that she referred to her stepmother as Mrs. Borden, and was unsure if they had a cordial relationship. One thing she was sure of was that she believed Abby had married her father for his money. Bridget Sullivan, the Borden's Irish-born 25-year-old live-in housekeeper, testified that Lizzie and Emma rarely ate meals with their parents due to the palpable tension in the Borden home. In July 1892, an unspecified family dispute prompted both sisters to take lengthy vacations in New Bedford. Lizzie chose to remain in a local boarding house for four days after returning to Fall River a week before the murders, before finally returning to the family residence. Before the murders, tensions were rising within the Borden family, particularly over Andrew's donations of real estate to various members of Abby's family. The evening before the murders, Lizzie and Emma's maternal uncle, John Vinicum Morse, was invited to stay for a few days to discuss business matters with his brother-in-law, Andrew. Some authors have theorized that their conversation, especially regarding property transfer, may have exacerbated an already tense situation. Before the homicides, 
the entire household had been violently unwell for several days. Later, a family acquaintance hypothesized that the mutton left on the stove for several days to be used in meals was the cause, but Abby had feared poison given that Andrew had not been a popular man, especially with his spoiled daughters. On August 4, 1892, Bridget Maggie Sullivan, the maid, awoke with such severe nausea that she threw up after preparing breakfast. Andrew and Abby had also been violently ill, and Mrs. Borden had visited the family doctor, Dr. Bowen, the day before, alleging she had been poisoned. The doctor believed the family had food poisoning after eating rancid meat left on the stove. Sullivan was then instructed to clean all the exterior windows, leaving Lizzie and her stepmother alone in the home. Andrew was out running errands, Emma was meeting friends in another city, and their uncle and house guest, John Morse, was visiting other relatives. Abby went upstairs shortly before 9.30 to make Morse's bed. However, the home was about to descend into chaos. As Sullivan went to let Andrew into the house, she heard laughter emanating from the second floor. Shortly after Andrew entered the house, Lizzie told him that Abby had received a note from a sick friend and had gone to visit her. Andrew decided to take a quick nap while his wife was apparently out visiting a friend. Around the same time that Andrew Borden chose to take a nap, which was around 11 a.m., the housekeeper decided to do the same. A few minutes later, she awoke to the sound of Lizzie Borden's screams for help. Father's dead, Lizzie screamed. Somebody's come in and killed him. Sullivan raced downstairs and was about to enter the sitting room, but before she could see Andrew's corpse, Lizzie sent her to retrieve Dr. Bowen and her close friend Alice Russell. Andrew had been struck 11 times with an axe or hatchet, so violently that his face was unrecognizable. As Dr. Bowen examined the body, however, a neighbor named Adelaide Churchill started wondering where Abby was. Lizzie then claimed she heard her stepmother enter the house and ascend the staircase, prompting Sullivan and Churchill to search the house. Abby Borden was discovered dead in the upper guest room, the victim of 18 or 19 brutal strikes. During their inquiry, the police discovered the head of a hatchet lacking the handle in the cellar. Although it was regarded as a murder weapon, it appeared surprisingly clean for something that had just been used to slaughter two people. Initially, investigators speculated that this was the work of an outsider, but because the Bordens kept their doors locked nearly all the time, it would have been difficult for someone to gain entry. In other words, the murderer may have been inside the house the entire time. Focus almost immediately fell on Lizzie, the only other person believed to have been in the house at the time of both homicides. A great deal of circumstantial evidence pointed in her direction after all. For example, Lizzie was seen burning a blue dress in her kitchen furnace three days after the murders. Her excuse? Lizzie claimed it was covered in paint, so she had no choice but to burn it. According to a clerk at a local pharmacy, Lizzie had visited the store the day before the murders in an attempt to buy prussic acid, an exceedingly toxic substance. She claimed that she needed it to sanitize her furs, but the timing in relation to the murders was strange. Lizzie claimed she was in the attic of the barn in the backyard, eating fruit and searching for fishing sinkers when Andrew was murdered. She claimed to have spent a considerable amount of time outside on the day of the murders, but the police were skeptical, stating that it was far too hot that day for anyone to spend more than a couple of minutes in the stifling hot loft and that they did not find any footprints in the attic. Others questioned how Lizzie could have been inside during Abby's murder and not heard the vicious attack taking place. Alice Russell, Lizzie's acquaintance, claimed that Lizzie had expressed concern that something unpleasant might happen to her father. In addition, there was the matter of the note that Lizzie claimed Abby Borden received that morning, asking that she visit her sick friend. The authorities were unable to find it anywhere. Abby was murdered around 9.30 and Andrew was killed around 11. If a stranger had committed the murders, he would have had to wait in the house for 90 minutes or leave in between the homicides before returning, 
neither of which a calculating killer would have done. Several days after the murders, when Lizzie was questioned at a coroner's inquest, things did not go well for her. Her testimony was contradictory and sketchy. The majority of officers who interviewed Borden disliked her demeanor. Some said she was too calm and collected. Her statements, coupled with the circumstantial evidence, led to her arrest and the beginning of one of the most sensational trials in American history. The trial began on June 5, 1893, and according to contemporary commentators, the Lizzie Borden case was far more important than the Chicago World's Fair. Lizzie's trial wouldn't disappoint when it came down to sensational events in the courtroom. At one point, the prosecution displayed Andrew and Abby's skulls to the court, causing Lizzie to collapse in the courtroom. Judges ruled Lizzie's inquest testimony was inadmissible as she did not have legal counsel at the time and she was interrogated while under the influence of morphine prescribed by her doctor. The judges also excluded evidence regarding the prussic acid. The defense team did an excellent job of getting state witnesses to contradict themselves and discrediting several of the prosecution's most important arguments. The state asserted, for instance, that no one ever discovered the handle of the murder weapon because Lizzie burned the shaft because it was covered in blood. This was, however, impossible to prove. In addition, the defense pointed out how clean the hatchet head was and how unlikely it was for Lizzie to clean the murder weapon and conceal her bloody clothes in a few minutes between murdering Andrew Borden and summoning Bridget Sullivan. When the prosecution suggested that Lizzie may have committed the offense in the nude, the defense simply scoffed it out of court. Lizzie's attorneys also discovered witnesses who had seen a suspicious person near the Borden residence, as well as handymen who had been working in the attic shortly before the crimes, casting doubt on the police's footprint evidence. In quick succession, Lizzie's attorneys dismantled the prosecution's case at every turn. Lizzie Borden's trial lasted two weeks, and by its end, it appeared that she would be acquitted. The defense had effectively prevented key prosecution witnesses from testifying and portrayed Lizzie as a virtuous woman incapable of committing such an atrocity. In fact, before sending the jury to deliberate, one of the judges admonished them to take Lizzie's Christian character into account when deciding her fate. When the 12 men of the jury returned after only 90 minutes, according to some accounts they reached a verdict in 30 minutes and waited so as not to appear suspicious, Lizzie Borden was found innocent. Lizzie screamed with delight upon hearing the verdict, a sentiment shared by the majority of the media. While it is true that the state failed to prove Lizzie's guilt, it is also true that the all-male jury was likely influenced by the attitudes of the time. People in 1893 could not believe that Lizzie, a Sunday school teacher from a wealthy family, could have committed such a heinous crime. In addition, since Massachusetts had not executed a woman since 1778, this jury was likely not eager to become the first jury to do so for over a hundred years. Lizzie left the courtroom a free woman, and the murders of Andrew and Abby Borden remain unresolved to this day. After starring in the trial that captivated the nation, Lizzie Borden put her father's money to good use by buying a home in an affluent neighborhood and named her home Maplecroft. Lizzie and Emma shared a home, but their relationship soon soured and her sister moved out. In addition to buying a new home, Lizzie changed her name to Lizbeth and traveled to major cities such as Boston and New York, but she was unable to escape her past. Even though she was acquitted, the citizens of Fall River continued to harbor suspicions, and Lizzie Borden was gradually shunned. Lizzie eventually became ill, and after a year of health problems, she passed away in June 1927. As you can imagine, nobody attended the funeral. She was buried next to her murdered parents. So, what could have prompted Lizzie Borden to brutally murder her parents? Andrew Borden was one of the wealthiest individuals in Fall River, with an estate valued at approximately $7 million by today's standards, but little was spent to make the Borden's life more comfortable. In 1887, when Andrew gave a home to Abby's sister, 
the situation deteriorated further. Emma and Lizzie believed that their father preferred his in-laws to his own flesh and blood, and this allegedly made the Borden household somewhat hostile. Add to that the fact that the Borden sisters never liked their stepmother, and you have the makings of a double-axe murder. Do you think Lizzie Borden killed her parents? Please leave us a comment below. We would love to hear from you.